question comes from the product, right? The, we should be talking about product and technology. It's Carnegie Mellon. Well, the fact is that the business plan is another opportunity for innovation. And so you shouldn't discount that. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to be very innovative with the business plan. So I'm going to very briefly, and I'm not going to go through a lecture here on business models, but I want to at least expose you to some of the possibilities. So who's heard about the long tail business model? You've heard about it just recently, so you don't count. Who else? What's the long tail business model? So what you said was targeting a small subset of the population. And when you do that, what, what goes along with that? Uh, well, I don't know. There's plenty, there could be plenty of competition, but it's very, very customized in terms of the value proposition, right? Right? Yeah, so you know, it used to be when you went to um, the Blockbusters video stores, anybody remember that? You may all, some of you are old enough to remember Blockbusters. You know, you'd walk in and there'd be a counter with the new movies on VHS tapes. And uh, you might get some old favorites over in this section or that section. Um, but you really had a pretty limited choice. Um, the same was true with bookstores, right? You'd go into Barnes & Noble and they had shelf space. And they would generally put the big selling products on there, right? Well, with the advent of the internet, of course, it allowed you to be a whole lot more customizable. And what the internet technology gave us was the ability to reduce that variable cost of distribution to something close to zero. And when you do that, you can create a long tail model where you can have many, many, many variations of a product that are extremely focused and extremely niche oriented. So, you know, Blockbuster became Netflix, right? That's exactly what Netflix is, is a customized long tail model. I can go on there and watch, you know, whatever topic I wanna watch, right? And I may be the only one that watches it today, but the incremental cost of them delivering that service to me, the variable cost is so low that they can make it cost effective to do so. And, you know, Amazon is another great example of that. I can write a book. If I wanna write a book on Business Model Canvas and only one of you wants to buy it, I can write it and have it published on Amazon. Now, a second type of model is uh, multimodal business models. Most businesses have more than one customer. <clears throat> but the key is that not all customers pay for the service. Sometimes customers enable value to be realized by another customer. So reCAPTCHA is a famous CMU spin out, right? Everybody's used reCAPTCHA, right? What's reCAPTCHA do? Somebody. <laughs> What's reCAPTCHA do? Mm -hmm. and, uh, verify that you're not a robot. Like, right, prove you're, not, prove you're not an evil robot. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's going on when you do that? Like, your text looks goofy like this, right? What are you really doing when you do that? Transcribing old issues of the New York Times and books. Yeah, so you're not paying for it. The, the website that you're accessing isn't paying for it, typically an e-commerce provider. Um, the New York Times is paying for it because you're transcribing old, old newspapers and putting them into electronic form. And they actually have a third party customer that pays for the service. And when you think about what reCAPTCHA did, there's really nothing difficult from a technology perspective there. The innovation was all the business model, right? There's, of course, a, a bunch of companies that rely upon network effects where you have to get a, enough people using it to create value for everybody. Facebook, YouTube are good examples of that on a consumer side. Alibaba is a good example of that on more of a B2B approach, you know, that's, that's kind of a specialized exchange. Um, and then there's all the, the products, of course, that start with a free model. But how many, how many of you, raise your hand if you, 
pay for premium LinkedIn? How much you pay for premium LinkedIn? Yeah, in fact, if you're paying 150 a year, you're getting a better deal than me. It's amazingly expensive, right? It's, it is a cash machine, and it is a nice product. By the way, Dave Mullaney started a company that was sold to LinkedIn. I think it was the first acquisition they did, right? So all these free models um, are only free in order to get enough people using it to create value so that they can start to extract revenue, right? So Pandora is an example of that. Facebook makes obviously a ton of money on advertising, right? I don't pay for Facebook. My value is I, I participate in it because my kids are all over the place and it's a good way to keep in touch with them, right? But I'm getting advertised to all the time. So there really is no such thing as a free lunch after all. What about Ikea? I, I, Ikea didn't do anything with technology per se, but what they did do was actually very innovative, right? So they said, <clears throat> I'm gonna create a furniture product and I'm going to make it so that I don't have to pay for assembly, right? They basically pushed that off on you. How many of you have ever put together something from Ikea? Yeah, a lot, right? So they've sold a lot. And how long does it take to put that crap together? I put like a dresser together. It took me a whole day one time. There's a lot of labor that they don't have to give because you're doing that, right? Very innovative business model from that perspective. Nothing to do with technology. So business models are really important. And so let's talk about business models. Whoop. Go back, go back. There we go. This guy right here is Don Jones. He's, he's either on this column. No, that's Jack. He's on this column over here. Don was my professor when I was a student here. He and Jack taught the entrepreneurship program. Great, great entrepreneur. A good mentor but to both Dave and myself. And there's one thing that Don told me that I'll never forget. And I hope you remember this too. He said, he called me Bill. He said, Bill, stop making things so complicated. Business is really very simple. Everything, less is more when it comes to business, especially with startups, right? And that is really true. If you can't express your value proposition in a couple sentences, then you don't understand it well enough. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> and the same is true when you're, when you're analyzing your business model, right? So this is the business model canvas. I don't expect you to read all these little things here, but you can download this off the web. Um, and I'm gonna take you through how to use it. Now, this is what most people do. They come in here and they go, oh, customer segments. Let's list the customers. Let's write down everything we can about customers. Now let's do customer relationships. Let's figure out revenue. There's a very specific order that you use this tool with and as a collaborative tool for your team, right? So first thing you need to realize is there's nine boxes, but there's really two focuses of this, right? On the right side, you have everything is focused on the customer and the value that you're delivering to that customer. And on the left is all about execution. It's more internally focused. It's what, what's it, what, what happened there? What's it cost to deliver the value? Who are my partners? What do I have to be good at? Right? Everything's internal on the left. Everything's externally focused on the right. It's important to think about it that way. And like everything else with a startup, you always start with the external focus, right? You as a founder, frankly, should always be externally focused. So customer segments, you always start with a customer. And I already said you have more than one customer, right? So if you're defining your customer segments, and by the way, this is, I like the way this is so big, right? This is what you should have on your wall in whatever, wherever your team space is. This becomes your internal business plan so that everybody on your team, when they walk into your office, can see who's my customer? Am I, am I thinking of all of them? Have we defined all of them well enough? Are there any risks associated with them? And that ends up being put on the customer segment. Now, this is the way I tend to do it, and I don't think this is, this is not very techy, but I like it this way, right? Is I use the little 3M stickies, right? And I have three colors, green, yellow, and red. And as I'm defining my customers, I'll stick them up here and say, 
primary customer. This is how many there are. This is all the characteristics that define them. Everything I know about that customer will go on that sticky under customer segments. If I have customers that I think could be customers, or if there's some risk associated with them, they'll go up there as well, but they're not going on a green sticky. They're going to go on a yellow one or a red one. Red means I've got a risk here that I need to mitigate. And yellow means I have an unknown, which by the way is also a risk, right? But the unknown may be uh, just you need to go get more information, right? A risk could be a defined risk that you need to establish, right? But as you are defining your customer segments and using that technique, anybody who walks into the room immediately knows where the risk factors are. And by the way, as you gain more information, as you do a test, maybe an MVP that, that mitigates that risk, then that goes from red to green or red to yellow to green, whatever. So it's dynamic. It's not a one-time thing. This is not just something you do once. And that, by the way, is another thing that a lot of people do wrong with this. I, I've been in big companies that are trying to do innovation. And I say, have you done a business model canvas? And they go, oh, yeah, we did it. Here it is. Well, you don't, this is not a one-time thing. This is a collaborative tool that evolves over time. So think about your markets, how you segment them. Very, very important. The more you can segment your markets, the more you understand about your markets. I could give a whole talk just on that. Now, you don't just go left to right or right to left. You switch from customer segments to value proposition. And the reason you do that is that you need to define a value proposition for every customer, not just your primary customer, every customer segment that you're going to be affecting or touching. What happens if you have a customer segment where you're actually not helping them, you're hurting them? Can you think of an example of that? With my startup, MedSage, what I did was I used, it was a SaaS product that used automated phone calls to call home care patients. When we implemented our product, we increased sales of supplies for home health care providers by 500% the day we turned it on. Do you think the health insurance companies like that? Well, they were buying, they were paying for a lot more CPAP masks, right? But, so that was a risk, right? But they also, um, we're setting the rules, right? They said, I'll pay for a new mask every six months. So I was mitigating that risk by the fact that I was following their rules. If those aren't the right rules, then change your rules and the software will adjust automatically, right? Plus, if a, if a patient gets new compliant with the therapy, and hopefully they don't develop congestive heart failure and become even more expensive, right? So it if you identify a value proposition that's negative, you need to also identify value propositions that counter that, right? Um, but it should be by every segment. So you start with customers and then you go to value proposition. Now, the important thing here is you need to quantify it and detail is important. Detail is important on the customer segment. Detail is important on the value proposition segment. But it's not going to be important in every one of these segments. So I'm going to tell you why. So you know, define the value, quantify the value. So what form does value take? I mean, you can create value by saving somebody money. You can create value by helping them make more money, saving them time, or establishing some kind of a relationship, right? It could be, you know, I, I, I'm a, I have an, a profile on Facebook because it helps me maintain my relationship with my kids in California. Right? That's still a value proposition. Right? Wherever possible, quantify that value proposition and go into as much detail as you possibly can. Now, after you do that, the next one you go to is revenue. So we're not going left to right again. So let's talk about revenue. What is revenue? Somebody tell me what revenue is. What's revenue? Price. Price times units. Okay, very mathematical answer. Anybody else? Capturing the value. That's very close to what I'm looking for. Very, very close. Have you already heard my talk on this? 
All right. Also true. He's the closest to, uh, what's your name? Yeah. Jesse's. Jesse is the closest to what I'm looking for. Any, one more try. Anybody else? Cash in the bank. That would be cash, not revenue. Cash. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'll give it to you. All right, so here's what I'm really looking for. Revenue is at its most basic level. Revenue is a measure of how your customers value your product, right? It is their, it's their way of showing you that they value what you did. So you were very close, Jesse. Um, and so when you think about revenue, it comes after value because you just quantified the value for each segment, right? And I will tell you that every time we go into this revenue section, let me, let me back up for a second. Every time we talk about revenue, people start saying, I gotta figure out price if I have to figure out revenue because the gentleman in the back said, revenue is your price times your units, right? So if you don't know your pricing, you, you can't possibly get revenue. And I just told you that detail is really important with customers and with value proposition. I'm going to tell you it's not with this. Forget about your price right now as you're doing business planning. Because I guarantee you, whatever product you're working on, you think you know what your price is and you're wrong. You're almost always wrong. Don't waste your time on that detail on price yet. Focus more on what's the value that you're providing and how will my customer repay me for that value, right? What's the, what's the value exchange? That's the revenue part. So think about this. If I'm generating $100 worth of value, I might just do this. If I'm generating $100 worth of value, right? So this is the value proposition quantified in the second box, which is value proposition for one segment. And let's say it's $100 and I need a goodness factor now. Let's define goodness factor. Were you here for Dave Mawinney's talk? Remember? Anybody remember what goodness factor is? So you did hear that talk. Yeah, so the, so the guy that coined that term is Don Jones again, when, when Dave and I were students here. And it's not a complicated thing, right? The bottom line is that if I'm generating $100 of value, are you going to pay me $100 for it? You're not? Why not? I just gave $100 worth of value. So it's $100 and you're paying $100. Why bother, right? Why bother even making that exchange, right? There's a switching cost for any transaction you ever do. You have to make something significantly better or there's no incentive for people to do it. And Don's premise was it has to be three times. Um, if it's a software product, it's probably got to be higher than that. My goodness factor for MedSage was five times, right? Because I increased revenue fivefold. It's not uh, written in stone that it has to be three or it has to be 10, but it is written in stone that it has to be significant enough to increase, uh, to, to overcome the switching costs for that customer, right? So I use 10 in this example, right? If the goodness factor is 10 for my product that I want it to be uh, at least 10 times better than the alternatives, whether that's saving money again, making money. In my case, it was making money, but it could be saving money, um, saving time. But if it's 10, then I can charge $10 for it, right? The value that I can extract from it is $10. Is that a price? It's not really a price, right? That's really just my share of the value that I'm creating with the product, right? But it is enough for me to start to figure out how big is this opportunity, right? If there's 10 million potential customers and I can, in my share of the value that's created is $10, then I know that it's a $100 million opportunity, right? And that helps me start to figure out, is this worth my time, right? Is this business opportunity actually worth the most precious commodity that I have, which is my time, right? We all have limited quantities of that.
So um, we, we really don't have price, but that's good enough for this stage of, of developing the business model. So now, if you look at the business model canvas, it's gonna give you lots of detail. It could be an asset sale. It could be a usage fee. You could charge subscriptions. I charge subscription with a transaction fee with my product, right? You could license it. You know, it could be an advertising model. It could be fixed. It could buy, be dynamic. There's a lot of variation there. And those are all important when you get to that point, right? After you've started to prove the value proposition, you can start to experiment with different pricing models. But the first step is understanding the value and then your share of the value. And you know, when we're talking about early startups, which most of you are doing, that's good enough. So use that and then again, evolve it, right? So over time, this may say, our share of the, of the value is $10 and our revenue is $10 times however many units we sell. And that would probably be a yellow or maybe even a red sticker on, on my business model canvas. That has to be validated probably with an MVP test and a lot of customer discovery. And it will be refined over time. And at some point we'll be to the point where we're gonna use a subscription fee with the transaction fee associated with it, right? That detail comes later on in the process. So if you go that far, right? And by the way, this is where I say, don't get hung up on details here because you'll be wrong. Um, you've really only done three boxes, but what can we tell just from those first three boxes? Well, first of all, we understand our customer in great detail. So on the customer segment, I wanna see lots of detail here and I wanna see that evolve. Two, we understand what they get from our product and how they value it. We understand if the opportunity is big enough for us to bother with. And then there's one other thing that we understand that most people forget, and it may be the most important thing of these four things. What, any guesses of what that is? What's, what might the fourth thing be that we get from just those first three boxes? Valuation? Eh. Valuation is a very complex topic. You probably don't know a lot about valuation yet. I mean, you have some indication because it's a big opportunity, you know, and potentially profitable. We haven't even gotten the cost yet, right? So you really only know what your share of the revenue is. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that gets a little bit to what he was just saying you know, in the same area, what, what, other, what other thing might we know? That's kind of a trick question, I will admit. Because the most important thing that we get out of this is what we don't know. It identifies what we don't know, and those become blaringly obvious, right? Because they are red stickers up on this board, and the whole team knows where our risk is. And the secret to being a successful entrepreneur is to be laser focused on risk and risk management and identifying the risks as early as you can and mitigating them as early as possible and not being afraid of failure that might occur from that. You know, if you identify a risk, attack it. It's human nature to go, well, I feel a lot more comfortable about the things I know. And so they spend their time that and that's a waste of time. Spend your time on the things you don't know. Yes. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the customer segment? Uh, specifically, I've seen challenges um, raised by who's the payer, who's the user, who is uh -huh. the referrer or facilitator mm -hmm. of the product uh, or the channel. Yeah, so, so let me rephrase so everybody can hear your question. Um, Essentially, you're asking the identifying the customers and who the paying customer is, who perhaps an enabling customer is, who um, you know a, a third-party customer might be, is more complex than people give credit to, right? Is that kind of what I'm paraphrasing? But that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. That. Are, what, what area are you uh, working in? Like what market? Yeah, <laughs> I knew that before you even said it. Yeah, because that's so true in healthcare, right? So, um, you know, when I look at, you know, most of my business have been healthcare, right? And when I look at MedSage, there was 
There was the home health care provider who paid for my product. There was the patient who had to take those phone calls, and if they didn't take them, then no value was created. There was the, the payer, the insurance company. There was the physician who referred that home health care provider. Um, there were consumers of my outcomes data. So I just listed five without even trying, right? That's true with healthcare in spades. And it's really true in most markets, right? If you really think about all the different parties that you impact. And it is really important to not just define the customers, but make sure that you're solving the problem for the customer who's going to pay for the product, right? You have to make sure that your primary customer, the person that's paying the bills, is getting their problem solved. In fact, I give a whole, I, I mentioned earlier that I might, I got involved with CMU because I kept coming back and telling the story of MedSage, and that was true with MedSage. I started solving the problem of improving compliance for the patient. Well, the patient doesn't pay for it, right? The home care provider pays for it. And so you need to make sure you're solving the problem, the right problem for the right customer, and you have to define all of them. So, I mean, is that what you're getting at? I mean, it, it's incredibly important that you define who your primary customer is. And if you change that, which I did, it changes everything. It changed my product, it changed my business. It was the, the reason we succeeded rather than failed. Yeah. How do you understand the unknowns? How do, you un oh, how do I understand the unknowns? Yeah. So as you're going through this process of defining this, it's incredibly revealing because if you have to write down all those customers and you can't tell me you know, if somebody says, well, what about the patient? Is the patient a customer for this? If you can't define why they would participate and what they get out of it, that's a risk. And that's an unknown that you have to solve, right? So if you as a group are defining the value proposition, as this is just one example for a customer segment, and you can't properly answer exactly why they would participate in it, that's an unknown. That's a risk. And now you need to go back and either do more customer discovery or run a test or perhaps change your business model, right? But it makes it blaringly obvious that you've got an issue here you have to address. That's what I mean by it, it, you know what you don't know, right? You know where your risks are and where you need to focus. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Well, then re rephrase it if I didn't answer. So you're asking how do, how do I know what I don't know? Well, there is always that risk, right? That, but that's what this process is designed to help you do, right? You, if you force yourself to define the customers and the value proposition, you're forcing yourself to go through the discipline of uh, nailing that stuff down. And the first time you go through that process, you're going to realize you know less than you think you do, right? And that's going to make the unknowns more obvious. And by the way, then it makes it more obvious for the whole team and everybody focuses on those things. Mm -hmm. you know, I have the green assumption where I know I validate it and verify right. it. Right. Or I keep it red because I have really have the best view. Right. So every statement that's in there. Yeah. Starting point is an assumption. That's right. And and you're we you and I are saying exactly the same thing. If there's an assumption, you need to validate it. Or a, or a hypothesis. You you need to, to run a test to prove that it's correct or not. And until you do, it's a risk. Right? Same thing. Okay. Now, who's this guy? Jeffrey Goldblum, yeah, from Jurassic Park. So my, my favorite scene from that movie is when he said when they are asking his opinion, and he said, "Your scientists are so preoccupied with whether they could do do that, they didn't stop to think of whether they should." Right. With these first three boxes, you need to be Jeffrey Goldblum and saying. Can I do it? And should I do it, right? Just because you can do it doesn't mean that you should. It may not be a big enough problem. It may be too risky of a solution. You may not have the right team or tools yet to be able to do it, right? But challenge, challenge your assumptions as you go through that process with just the first three boxes. Now, when you go beyond that, I'm going to go through the second half of this pretty quick. Let's do a time check here. 110. Yeah, because I want to have somebody try this out. 
The, the second half of this, I'm gonna do this pretty quickly. However, I wanna spend a little time on these two boxes, customer relationships and customer channels. And I do that because in my experience, I've seen it over and over and over. People always get these two confused and they don't use them properly. They are distinctly different, right? So customer relationships are, what does your customer expect from you through the entire lifetime of their using of your product? So the best example that I have from my experience is when I started MedSage, we used automated phone calls to call a patient. The patient could order supplies. By the virtue of the fact that we were more successful at connecting with those patients, we generated more revenue. And our customers loved that for a while. And then they would, you, what would happen is that they would have turnover in their staff and they wouldn't tell us and they would just pass their password on to the new employee and they wouldn't properly be properly trained. And the benefits and the value would slowly decay. And what we found was we needed to have uh, a reporting capability that would allow us and our customer to track how they were using our product and whether they were using it effectively. And a little bit of a consultative capability where we had an account manager that would get on the phone with them once a quarter and take them through that data. And interestingly enough, with that data, I could tell them anything more than they knew about their business, right? I could tell them exactly what was working and wasn't working. And I could also tell them how they compared to their peers in the marketplace with a benchmarking, right? By doing that, we stopped that decay because if they saw they were having a problem, it was raised to the, the owner's attention and changes were made. We also made the product more viable long-term, right? So that account manager position is something I didn't envision in the beginning. I didn't know I'd need it, but that's a key part of the customer relationship, right? I needed to have a dedicated customer service and account management staff. And that was a cost that fortunately for me, I was willing, able to uh, take on because my margins were high enough to continue to make the value long-term uh, what the customer expected and needed, right? But it would have been better if I had thought about that earlier, right? So think about that. That's what customer relationships mean. Is this gonna be a self-deployed product? Is this gonna be something they can buy online and you don't need to support it? Or is this something that you're gonna need to have you know, a chat capability or a live customer service group. That's all important. Channels are different. Channels are, how does your customer find you? How do they buy your product? How is it delivered, right? Th those are actually much more marketing and sales focused. And they're distinctly different from customer relationship. Think through all of those things. And by the way, the first time you do it, you'll have lots of unknowns, especially as we continue to go on through this process. I like to, to focus on the first three because if you don't get those first three right, then the rest of it's a waste of time. Now we're going over to the left side. So key activities. What do you need to do to deliver the value? Right? Do I need a warehouse? Do I need a bunch of engineers? Do I need a... a, a uh, a server farm? Do I need a uh, manufacturing site? And wh who are the key resources? Do I need a warehouse? Um, also partners, right? Are there partners that can help me with this? And last is, what's it cost? <coughs> you can't do any, you can't do this until you've done everything else because you need to know What's it gonna to take to deliver that, that product? Now, by the time you have that, then you can go back and do a bit of a cost analysis and say, what's my profit? You know, If I'm doing $10 per customer revenue, let's say that's a year's value and my direct cost is $3. You know, I've got a direct margin that tells me that I can at least generate from a direct margin perspective, $70 million in cash to help support the business. There's always, a, you know, fixed cost, overhead, development costs, R&D, all that kind of stuff. But start with, can I generate at scale a profit? And is it sufficient to make this something that's worthwhile going after? <clears throat> so 
this is my summation slide, and then I'd like to have a guinea pig come up here. Business model canvas. Um, this is your internal business plan. When I was a student here, and I was working with Jack Thorne and Don Jones, we wrote these big complicated business plans. And I still have students to this day who will come to me the first time they meet me and have drafted up this big, they have this big document where they wrote up a formal business plan. Some schools actually still teach it that way. We do not. This replaces all that, right? Because this changes and evolves over time. This is your internal business plan. You need to be as specific as possible and quantify everything that you possibly can. Um, really, really focus on customers and value proposition and use it in the order that I just described it to you and then use it as a way to prioritize your risk. Manage that risk first, mitigate that risk first, and as you knock them off, your, your risk profile goes down. And Jesse, you mentioned value, right? So value is a function of risk. If you're eliminating that risk, you're gonna get a better value if you try to go do an invest, investment round. Um, and it's not a one-time thing. This is, this is a collaborative tool that the whole team can use and evolves over time if you use it properly, All right? So I think if you go down and look at one of these teams down there, the, the uh, PRE, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. They have their business model canvas on the wall. Yeah, you, you right? You still have it on the wall? Yeah, we use it every day. Exactly, good. <laughs> then I'm not gonna use you as the guinea pig because you've already done it. So. I think that's it. Who wants to be a guinea pig? Any questions, comments? Not from you. No, go ahead. What's up? Did we uh, try that for any companies that already exist, or did you want to do that? Like, well, <clears throat> you can do it for any company that already exists, um, but in my opinion, the value of this is to use it to analyze a new, a new business idea that you're, <clears throat> you're trying to execute on, right? So it, that could be a new business idea within an existing company, right? And I've used it that way with some of my Vistage uh, comrades, um, and it works very effectively for that or for a startup. I mean, if the company already exists, hopefully you've mitigated most of those risks already, so it's a little less valuable. So there's another tool that helps you identify risks like that. Have you ever heard of the Porter's Five Forces Analysis? That's a great tool for identifying regulatory risk. Um, so this is not the only, the only way you identify risk, right? But you could just as easily put that over into um, tasks and say, we have to get FDA approval and that's a high risk item, right? And that, that ends up over here you know, in the, the key task area. Yeah. Yes. Why should you make a business plan even though it's probably going to be wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to your question earlier, right? So if it's going to be, it's going to evolve over time. The first time you put it out there and put everything you know out there, you're going to have lots of unknowns. You'll probably have assumptions that you're wrong about, right? And so if the assumption is wrong and you can't prove that it's correct, it should be a high risk assumption on there. And that's what you're gonna focus on, do an MVP test or maybe do cut more customer discovery. And the fact that you're identifying that early really increases your ability to mitigate that earlier and be successful before you go too far, right? So the, the perfect example of that, and, and I hate the fact that I keep using MedSage as an example, right? But when I first started, working on the idea of MedSage, my idea was a piece of hardware. Remember, I'm a mechanical engineer, right? So I had a medical device with some software. And I went out and tried to raise $750,000 to fund that. This is shortly after 9-11. I'm gonna use that as an excuse because I sucked as a fundraiser because I successfully raised $55,000. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was forced then to scale everything down and just do 
a small piece of what my vision was and then test that assumption and find out, is that really helping my customer or not, right? And by way of forcing myself to do that, I didn't make the mistake of building what I thought the market needed. I ended up building what the, part, the market actually wanted, right? And this helps you do that too, right? If you identify the holes in your business model early and then mitigate them, you save yourself a lot of trouble. If I had built, if I had raised that 750, I would have built the wrong thing. I guarantee I would have failed. Yeah. So if I'm understanding your question correctly, I think you might be confusing, in my mind at least, the difference between value proposition and business model. In my, in my opinion, you have one business model with multiple customers. Each one of those customer segments has their own value proposition, right? And you know, there may be elements of this that serve one customer versus another, but it's one business model that hopefully provides synergistic value for everybody involved. Now, on the other hand, you're gonna have, we didn't talk about the customer persona map. I think Dave probably talked about that when he did customer discovery. You're gonna have one of those for every segment, right? So there's a lot of detail on the customer side. Other questions? How are we doing time-wise? 122, we have like five minutes. Anybody wanna be a quick guinea pig? Sure. Come on up. What's your name? John, come on up, John. All right. You asked lots of good questions, so this should be fun. Yeah. So t give us the elevator pitch. What's your business idea? Uh, my business idea is what I like to call beer here. It's a price discovery platform that helps users find the cheapest price of beer. Uh, I like to call it the gas buddy of beer. <laughs> okay. So, And this is born out of a, a personal experience? <laughs> okay. All right. So here we go. Let's 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 take a shot at this. Who are the customers? Uh, the customers are people kind of like me, uh, twenty-one to thirty-five year olds who enjoy drinking beer. I'm probably spelling connoisseurs wrong, right? So twenty-one to thirty. Why why twenty-one to thirty? I'm fifty-six, so I can't drink beer. Is that what you say? People like me are real price sensitive. Uh, and they'll probably spend more time looking for the cheapest price of beer than you who someone has a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> who said I have a lot of money? Compared to me. Well, I don't know. I don't know how much money you have. Okay, so that you're defining this segment. Any other segments? Yeah, the people who uh, are going to be paying us. We think bars will pay us. Uh, bars. So. Who else? Uh, beer distributors and people who produce beer, like uh, Anheuser Busch, something like that. And the beer producers. Um, who else? How about anybody else? What? Who else? So, so what you're saying is that that there's other segments within the consumer side of this, right? Right, for whatever reason, right? I, I agree with you. I mean, so don't limit yourself to just this segment when you're doing this, right? So when you're doing a business model canvas, put everything you can think down, and then you may eliminate them later on, right? You may decide that, you know, some 56-year-old uh, professor shouldn't drink beer and so he goes off the list, right? That's okay, but put them down first and then take them back off if you prove them not to be customers is my suggestion there. Because you may be missing a great group here, right? Now I may say something that somebody doesn't like and they fire me and now, I'm, now, I, now I need cheap beer, right? <laughs> right? Um, what about uh, um, 
what are they called? The the breweries, like the the specialty brewery kind of thing. That's such a big deal now. Craft breweries. Yeah, craft breweries. I was putting them here with bars and beer distributors or beer producers because they kind of fit like both of those. Because like most of the micro breweries are also a bar, but they're also a beer producers. Okay, so again, another thing is segment them as deeply as you can at first. So this might be you know craft brewers and just regular bars. Uh, I could see this being, um, you know, bars or restaurants or other categories within that supplier segment as well. So uh, how many people drink beer between the age of 21 and 30? Uh, in Pittsburgh, I think there's about 100,000. Are, are you just making that number up or? or uh, So the, you have census data that says there's 70,000? 21 to 35 year olds. Okay. We're going to put that in blue. So there's 70,000, 20, 21 to 35 mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. Correct. And then of that, you're adding to it another 30K for students. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? All right, but how many of them drink beer? Oh, that's a good question. I like to think all of them. Ah. But realistically, I think half. Okay, so we're going to say 50 percent, but that's a, that's an unknown assumption. If you use his term. That's an assumption. You need to validate that, right? So that's going to be in red, and your whole team is going to know. We need to figure out, you know, specifically how many of these use it. If this is our segment, so that we can identify that. So um, who's the primary customer here? So are the customers the people using it or the people paying us? Who pays you for it? Bars. The bars pay you for it. Why do they pay you for it? Why do bars advertise on Yelp? To get their bar listed, uh, to display their happy hours, uh, to help get people through the doors during the right hours. So. People come through the doors. Why do they care? That helps increase the revenue. OK. So if we're doing value proposition, and bars are your, your primary paying customer, you're saying you're going to increase the revenue. Mm -hmm. By how much? That's an unknown. OK. So I'm going to color red percent increase in revenue is a value proposition for your primary customer that you're hypothesizing and you're probably you may be right but you haven't you really don't know by how much right so that goes on there as a high risk item it makes it obvious now that you know you asked the question earlier about what do you mean by what you don't know this is a high risk item that you need to now verify and everybody on the team knows that I need to verify how big the market is and whether these guys get a benefit that we think it does. So how would you do that? How would, how would you answer that question? Well, uh, do a little test run. Uh, do a little test run. Yeah. So what would that look like? So I could do a test run for, I could run an ad for Mario's and Shadyside and see how much I increase the people coming through the door, increase their revenue during that specific test run. Okay. And it's just an ad, or is it a, a, on an app or something that you're developing? It's on an app that we're developing. Do you need to develop an app, or could you do it with just an ad? We have an app. Uh, oh, okay, well, let's assume you don't. <laughs> do you really need an app, or could you just do that with a Facebook ad, maybe, or an Instagram ad, or a Twitter ad, or something like that? So you, that's, so you need to challenge yourself on how, what the easiest way is to answer this question as early on as possible. Because once you built the app, you've invested some, some you may have not have invested money, but again, your most valuable uh, asset is your time, and you've definitely invested time. 
right? Before you really know if you're actually helping anybody or how much or if it's enough to make it worthwhile for me to develop the app, right? So identifying that risk very early on is really important. So now let's just make an assumption. We're gonna just go through this chain here because we don't have a lot more time. But So how much do you think an increase in revenue um, would need to be to make it worthwhile for Mario's to advertise their service on your product? Not very high. Uh, bars don't make a lot of money. The average bar, their, uh, how much money they bring in is usually less than, or like net revenue is like 10%. So I think anything what, do you, what do you mean net revenue? You're saying the net, net profit, profit is 10%? Profit, so sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm a stickler on those kind of things because yeah. students tend to confuse them sometimes. Um, so net profit is 10%. What's the net profit on beer? Uh, normally 60%. Okay, so it's a, it's probably their highest margin or one of their highest margin products, mm -hmm. right? So you could impact their net profit a lot. You know, if you increase beer sales 10%, you're going to increase their net profit by more than 10% because you're increasing the their most profitable product, right? So what is that number? Like, how many more beers do you have to sell? That's an unknown. Unknown. Okay, so. When we do that revenue analysis that we were talking about, you need to, to look at, I'm gonna put it in red. Um, this is percent increase in beer sales. And then there's also a risk here, which is uh, contribution margin per, per increase in sales, right? So now this is a cost analysis that you can you're highlighting the fact that you need to go do by doing this exercise. And remember that napkin mm -hmm. analogy I used? You can boil it down to something exactly that simple. Like I, I increase their beer sales by, you know, three cases of beer and the contribution margin for a case of beer is blah. And so I'm generating a hundred dollars worth of value for them and I'm gonna charge them 10 bucks or whatever it is. Right? So you can start to see how big a market is that and where are my risks. But the reason I like to thank you, th that's good. Thank you very much, John. Um, the reason I like to do this is just to highlight any business is going to have all these kind of unknowns. And doing this process helps you kind of come to terms with those and identify those. Any comments or questions? I know we're out of time. Yeah. So, but the point that I think that illustrates is by doing that collaboratively, it brings out ideas that you wouldn't otherwise have, right? That's why it's really important you don't treat this as a, just a checklist of things I need to think about, but a collaborative tool and you put that up there and a team member goes, well, you know, what about, you know, what about theaters? Or why aren't we thinking about theaters? This could be a great opportunity, right? So that, that's the kind of thing that just breeds innovation and identifies opportunities that you may have not have thought of. And that's how you use this tool, right? It's a collaborative tool. It's a communication tool that everybody should be able to see. What's that? Yeah, yeah. See all these ideas? Anything else? How are we doing time-wise? We're, we're over time, aren't we? That's the classic for me, right? Over time. I'm only four minutes over. All right, I think we're done. Thanks for coming.